All right, thank you for having your Bible this morning. If you turn in them to 1 Samuel chapter 24. All right, you're going to remember this, this reference today. You're going to remember it next week because you'll remember what I preached last week. First thing, don't look at your notes. First Samuel chapter 24. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word. We'll read a few verses here. We'll pray, and then we'll get started with the message. First Samuel chapter 24, verse 1, it says, And it came to pass when Saul was returned from following the Philistines, that it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. And he came to the sheep coats by the way. There was a cave, and Saul went in to cover his feet. And David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. And the men of David said unto him, Behold, the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. And it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So David stayed his servants with these words, and suffered them not to rise against Saul. But Saul rose up out of the cave and went on his way. Let's pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day. Thank you again for uh, the singing and the worship. Father, as we lift up our hearts to you, I pray that we lift up them to you now, even now as the preaching um, goes forth. I pray that you would speak to us in our hearts, help us individually in our walks with Jesus Christ. I pray that we be more conformed to your image and to becoming more and more like Jesus. I do pray if there's any in this room that is not saved, I pray today would be the day of their salvation. Father, I pray that your word would go forth and accomplish that which it is going to do as you see fit. I pray that you speak to us this morning. Let your spirit move upon our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. So if you haven't got the gist by now, Saul is hunting David. Uh, he has it is, it is, uh, uh, open tag and, and uh, open season for David hunting. And so one day... Saul relieves himself and goes into the cave that David just so happens to be hiding in. And Gedi was a place where it was the spring of abundant waters, but in the cave uh, that he would hide in, uh, David would seek refuge there because it was a place that uh, many people would pass by, but he goes up into the rocks of the wild goats. Uh, 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 in Afghanistan, you have desert, kind of like Arizona. You have desert terrain, you have mountainous terrain, you have... Uh, uh, high desert, low desert, many things. Um, at 29 Palms was the same way where I was stationed. And you had many ranges that were in the rocks. Uh, you don't want to go over the rocks. Uh, but the Afghanis were like wild goats and they could run upon the top of the hills like ain't nobody's business. Uh, and it takes a lot of stamina, especially when you're wearing over 100 pounds of gear trying to run across the rocks while getting shot at. And so uh, David getting in these rocks and Saul trying to go hide, find him in the rocks, in the hold. And then just so happens, by God's providence, that Saul ends up in the same cave that David is hiding in. Amen. Then, we, then David's men somehow speak up and they whisper that God has delivered Saul into David's hands as like he said, here is Saul and he's putting him on a platter. He's right here. He's right here. It's like a deer who takes the lick of the uh, the salt rock or the, the bait pile, right? Or the fish that swims up and takes the lure. It's, it's that easy. But notice that his wow. servant's input in verse 4. Then the men of David said unto him, Behold the day which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thy, say it, enemy. Amen into thine hand. It's very dangerous to listen to the voice of one or many who don't fully know the situation. What do you mean? And they give you advice on what God would have you to do. Amen. Uh, there's a situation unfolding, and it has been unfolding for some time. David's been running, and this isn't the first instance. If you go back and read 1 Samuel, you'll see the many times and the many times he could have had him. Uh, just the hunting of David 
but now the men say, and this is all of his men, they say, and whisper and said, God's given you the enemy into your hand. And it's a dangerous thing <coughs> when you're seeking the will of God to listen to what other people think that God is telling you you should Amen. do. We, uh, we, me and Bill just so happened, I'm glad that we met him yesterday. It was a great sermon illustration for me. I didn't have nothing. And uh, we met a guy yesterday, and uh, he was cool, and he was he was figuring out where we were in the church, and he says, oh, there's a cross there. He said, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, there's a long driveway. Yeah, yeah, that's us. Yeah, why don't you come out? Come out. He didn't say he was coming out. He just wanted to know where it was. He says, I want to buy that thing. I was like, not before, but God gives it to us. <laughs> and uh, he says, what y'all need to do, what's a really good idea, y'all need to have a revival. I'm like, we've had three. Y'all need a PS. Well, we had one. <laughs> y'all need this. Y'all need that. Y'all, you, you know what you guys should do? You should contact this um, broker investor in New York. In New York. Oh. And his name is this. Here's my card. He gave me his card. And, uh, and he helps people with music and uh, distribution all that stuff. Call this, call this number. And I get this investor out here, and he can he can work something out for you. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Put the car in my pocket. Me and Bill walked away, and Bill's like, that would not be a good idea. I said, no, it won't. <laughs> <laughs> because he's some guy who's thinking from a worldly perspective on, hey, get an investor right. to give you this money, and then he can tell you what to do with the property. Amen. I said, my God owns the cattle on Thousand Hills. If he wants to give it to us, he'll give it to us. Amen. 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 If not, then, it, then whatever. So I just say that. But I don't say that just for a, a corporate mindset or a church mindset. In your own personal life. You are going through a situation right now, or you have been, or you will. Maybe just use this sermon and put it in your pocket. Put it in your toolbox and lock it. Don't throw away the key. Amen. Because you'll have to pull it out later sometime down the road. Yes. When you're doing the will of God, when you're in a situation, there will be people that come into your life that tell you what they think you should do or what God mm -hmm. would have you to do. Some of the time, it might be good advice. It might be a brother or sister in Christ. Uh, it might be another pastor. Uh, but you should seek counsel from the Lord in His Word. Amen. If his, if it, he'll never divorce His will from His Word. Amen. 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 Whatever His Word says, that's what He will use to get you to do the will of God. Amen. Right? We don't sit here and pray and, and just ask God for things and listen for the still small voice. That's not biblical. That, I, I don't, I, I'm, not, I'm not listening. God, are you out there? Are you going to speak to me? If you want to know what God wants you to do, and you want to hear it audibly, read the Bible out loud. Amen. Amen. Read this word. So David is, is sitting here in this cave. He didn't say anything. His men said something. Amen. And they said, hey, remember? God has given you your enemy. And he's put it on a platter. <coughs> David may have been hoping for a day, but I don't believe it was certainly this day. It wasn't this day. This, I see, was a test. David may have called Saul an enemy, uh, or the men may have thought that David called him an enemy. Maybe David would have been speaking of someone else. Maybe they misunderstood him, which is absolutely possible. Amen. When you're meeting people, they can misunderstand. Um, and David may have been referring to another one of Saul's followers in his army. I don't know. We don't know. But these men of David appealed to the fleshly side of David. Amen. I believe these men were used of Satan to tempt David to go against the will of God. Amen. Now David had all the right in the world, fleshly speaking, to, you know, from a human standpoint, from a natural standpoint, get all the right in the world to go and kill Saul. Well, he's hunting me. I'm just, you know, I'm going to take him out. Right? From a fleshly standpoint, from what our flesh would like or the world would like, uh, that's, you know, maybe he could get away with that. Amen. But this was a bit more than that. It was a bit deeper than that. Amen. He, David could conjure up all the reasons in the world for killing him and be justified in the eyes of the men that were following him and say, yeah, that's, that's right, I'm glad you did this. But he wouldn't be justified in the eyes of the people. He wouldn't be justified, most importantly, before the eyes of the Lord who sees all. Amen. Amen. If David killed Saul at that moment when he listened to his men, I don't believe he would have been fulfilling the will of God. Unless scripture said so differently, but I don't see scripture saying that. They didn't specific, this is what's interesting, is they didn't specifically say, hey, kill 
don't solve them. They didn't say that. I mean, your text just says, look, God said this, he'll deliver your enemy, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto you. You know, whatever you want. We're, 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 whatever you want to do, David, we're here for you. We're down for whatever. But they implanted the idea of doing harm to the king, the Lord's anointed. Amen. So he says, do what, seem, what shall seem good unto thee. And David, without giving much thought, in the heat of the moment, crouches towards Saul with his knife, his dagger, his sword, and cuts off Saul's robe privily. That word privily means silently and softly. Right? It's kind of like when you're a, 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 a sniper, you're doing reconnaissance mission. You're to get in and get out. Uh, you don't want to be seen, right? Where's Ambrose at? Ambrose, remember we were watching about the Navy SEALs on, on uh, Popular Mechanics for Kids, right? They're talking about how they want to go in for a hostage situation. They don't want to be seen. they got to move fast, quick, and get out, right? That's what David was wanting to do here. And so he cuts his robe privily, quietly, kind of just cut the fabric quietly because he's sleeping, right? You don't know if Saul's a light sleeper, a heavy sleeper. He's a CPAP machine. I don't know, right? Now I ask the question, did David do that? Did David cut off the skirt to appease his men? Did David do that to appease his own ego? Did David do that because he resented Saul and what he's been putting him through? Certainly David didn't resent what God uh, called him to do and what God put in his heart the moment that he met Goliath and went in and out among the people uh, and led the armies of Israel before this time. David didn't present any of that. But regardless of those facts, David somewhat gave into the temptation when they said, do, uh, do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Amen. He gave into that. Amen. Did he quench his resentment from Saul by cutting off the skirt? I'm not sure. But the other interesting thing is they say, back in verse 4, the Lord said unto thee, how do they know the Lord said? And, and maybe, I, maybe I read too fast through my Bible. I didn't catch anything. But he just said, Behold, the, the Lord said unto thee. Maybe this was an earlier time. Maybe I didn't catch it. But I'm preaching it this way anyway. So the Lord said unto thee, Behold, behold, I will deliver thee. Right? Amen. They didn't give David much time to think. Now, did they? They said, Hey, there it is. There it is. There's an opportunity. Take it. Take it, take it, take it. Isn't that what Satan does? Amen. Satan says, hey, look this way. Hey, listen to this. Hey, eat this. Hey, drink this. Hey, smoke this. Hey, listen to that. Yeah. And you're like, oh, 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 oh. Anxiety kicks in. Okay, i got to do it. So I can fulfill the flesh. They wanted him to make a decision. It's kind of like Amen. a car salesman. Yeah. He doesn't give you much time. He says, well, what do you think? Amen. Sixty thousand? Ain't that bad? Seventy thousand? Huh? Getting a little better. Joe Biden's third. Uh, I was gonna say third term. Third year in America? Eighty thousand? Come on, it's only getting better. Are you gonna buy? Are you gonna buy? Are you gonna buy? They wanted him to make a decision. They wanted him to be decisive, to take action. Amen. And so I say this: be careful of the pressure that people put on you to make a decision. Amen. Amen. Now, you say, well, pastor, we do that with people in salvation. We say, behold, today is the day of salvation. That's fine. But not egging them on. Like, uh, I, I, was, I was talking to Miss Bridget one time when she was in the hospital. We were talking about her dad. And, and Mikey actually was saying it. And he says, uh, he would not let this guy go. He says, you need to get saved. And he's like, come on, Grandpa, just leave alone. He said, no. He's like, no, he needs to get saved. And he just kept going at him. And he eventually got saved. Sometimes that happens to be persistent. But for certain matters, when it concerns the will of God, it's not good to be antagonistic and, and, and uh, pressurizing. Amen. Why do you say that? Well, I know sometimes there needs to be action. I mean, all the times there, need, there needs to be action, right? Amen. But be careful of the pressures that people put on you that is unnecessary. What do I mean? People have, and brothers and sisters in Christ have, limits in their faith. They hit a ceiling because they haven't broken to that next level yet. 
that's the furthest that they could go right now. Why? Because everybody's growing in their own progressive walk of sanctification. Amen. You know, everybody is different. Not everybody can be like you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Some people want things done ASAP. Some people wait to the very last minute Amen. and throw things together. Uh, and even them, some, some don't even bother to follow God by faith. They're just going with the flow, right? They're, they're saved, they're happy, they're going to heaven, and they never grow. And they'll have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ on that day. Yeah. Pressures will come when people's prescriptions, or sorry, perceptions aren't met. I'm going to say that again. Pressures will come when people's perceptions aren't met or satisfied. Pressures will come when people's perceptions of what they think ought to happen are not met. Amen. Pressures come on a leader, especially David here, to act when things aren't done according to the followers or his men's perceptions. Amen. People want it done a certain way. They want it done in a certain time frame. They want a certain person to do it. Which I can understand in business. I can't understand that in a church. But nobody takes into consideration what God wants. Nobody takes into consideration what God wants. Ain't that something? Yes. Say, so what, what, why don't we seek God's will in the matter? Right? What did, what did uh, uh, the, the apostles come when there was a, a neglecting of the ministration to the widows? In Acts. Said, hey, do something about it. Do something. He's like, it's not for us to go and serve tables. We're just supposed to study the Word Amen. of God in prayer. He says, but seek you out. They delegate says, seek you out, men full of the Holy Ghost, and make it happen. Amen. Make it happen, Captain. I'm going to stay in the box. I'm going to stay in the book. Right? Man's natural inclination is to go back to the flesh. Amen. The things of the world. Why? Because that's what we know. That's what he knows. That's Amen. what he's good at. That's what the natural man loves because that's what the natural man is. The here and now, the temporal, the immediate, the fading. Just like Israel, we read about in um, uh, Sunday school. When Moses went up to the Mount of God to be with God and to get his commandments, the people said to Aaron, what? Up! Oh, make us gods. We don't know what's happened to the man of God. we, we got to have our own gods now. we got to have some idolatry. we got to worship something. And he's gone. We don't know what's happened to us. Let's seek our own way. Amen. Let's seek our own way because we don't know what happened to him up there. I mean, he could be dead. He, uh, we don't know. We're looking like a bunch of idiots down here. What's wrong with that? What's wrong? What's wrong with just saying, "Well, I'm gonna," uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't know anything. It's been quite some time. It's been a while. I haven't heard from the Lord. I haven't heard from uh, Moses. Uh, um, what's just, you know, what's what's make some gods and get up? Well, wrong because it's idolatry. But what what's wrong with that is they didn't wait on God. Amen. We hate waiting on God. We hate waiting, period. Why do we have fast food? Why do we have, like, you go to a restaurant, but you can check in before you even get to the restaurant on your phone, so you don't have to wait. Amen. We hate waiting. And now I know that hasty decisions must be made at times. Uh, and and when, when a pressing issue comes up, right? If someone's bleeding out and they got a hemorrhage, okay, we got to take our belt off and make a tourniquet with this thing, right? That's a hasty decision, something that needs to be taken care of. Amen. Uh, 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 or, hey, there's a, um, uh, uh, a leaking pipe that's pouring down on Mondo right now. we got to fix that right now, but not until after the sermon, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so decisions um, are, are uh, an emergency response or whatever. They are very much needed, and they're very much appreciated, and they're very much desired, right? But the decisions need not to be hasty if you have some kind of pre-existing plan. And that pre-existing plan may not even come out to fruition in the way that you want it to. Amen. 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 Uh, they, they, uh, I forgot what the, the military says. Um, it's good to have a plan because then something can go wrong. Or something, like, something always goes wrong. I forgot how the saying goes. I don't remember. Um, but if, if there's a situation that needs to be handled, we always go back to what say the Lord. Amen. What, what does God's word say first? Amen. And then we always go to James 1 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not. Amen. Right? And so we can have that and it will be given to him. This is why we must be filled with the Spirit. Amen. The filling of the Spirit isn't just 
to lead people to Christ. Is not just to preach? Is not just to be a Sunday school teacher? Is not just to sing a special? It's to live every day of your life. Amen. To live the Christian life because Amen. it is God in you. It is God which worketh in you to both to do and to will of His good pleasure. Amen? Amen. And so we have to have the filling of the Holy Spirit for everyday living. And being filled of the Spirit isn't just a once a week deal. It's a life that is lived through Christ who strengthened me. Amen. Amen. That is what it is. The goal is to glorify God by emulating Jesus Christ in every area of my life. That's right. Every area. I'm going to say that again. The goal is to glorify God in, by emulating Jesus Christ in every area of my life. Amen. Amen. And, and, and so back to verse 5 now. It says, And it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. When he says, and it came to pass, we don't know if that was several minutes. We don't know if it was just after the incident. It had to be some time before Saul got in the cave, so we know it was pretty recent. But it says that David's heart smote him. What does that mean? You ever said something to your spouse? You ever said something to your kids? Maybe when you were a teenager, you said something to your mom or dad or a brother and sisters in Christ, and then afterward, you think it was terrible what you just said. So I should have said that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I should have right. said that. Yeah. Oh, man, that was so bad. Should I apologize? Do they understand? I'm going to apologize anyway. That's what David was feeling when he had done that to Saul. He says, oh, man, I should have cut his skirt. The men were wanting him to probably kill him, right? The, David's men were like, dude, kill Saul. And so they were probably expecting him to do that. And then when he cut his skirt, what do you think the men thought? They're like, yeah, what, what is this garbage? What is this trash? Uh, uh, cutting off Saul's skirt, you know, he's feeling guilty. Because when you don't do the will of God, it brings guilt. Amen. When you sin, it brings guilt. Amen. It brings shame. It, 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 it brings uh, disfellowship with the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. That, that's what David is feeling after what he's done. He's cutting off that skirt. He felt guilty. Now I want you to notice in verse 6. And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master. Amen. Wait, 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 wait. Did you notice the contrast between what the men said and what he said? The, 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 men, the men said, well, what does he say? The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. What did the men say? Behold, the Lord has said, I will deliver thine enemy. He, so Dave, Dave, David says, the Lord forbid, and they're saying, behold, the Lord said. Do we see that? There's a difference there. He says, God forbid. They say, well, God is allowed. Amen. God forbid, but here it is, right? Amen. And then David calls him master, the Lord's anointed, and the men of David say, well, he's an enemy. But David calls him master. Amen. David calls him the Lord's anointed. Yes. David's heart smote him because he knew what he had done in his heart was wrong. Yes. Amen. That's why D David is a very upright man, and we, we read... Um, Psalm 7 on Wednesday, and we know that he's upright in heart, and he, and he calls everybody out, and, and he says, God, if I am unjust in anything that I've done, if I've done some kind of sin or wrong, set up the court and try me and put me on trial. I will come forth as gold. Amen. Much. I'm going to come forth out of it because I have done everything in my integrity. Amen. But David here has now regretted oh. what he had done. He said, I should have never raised my hand against the Lord's Amen. Anointed. Not that I was trying to kill him, but I, I, just, I don't even know why I did that. Well, probably because there was some pressure. Probably because there was some temptation. Amen. Even though David had been anointed, he was already, he'd been anointed, and he will be king, he cannot attack the Lord's anointed. Amen. God's chosen king, or the people's choice. And so what resulted when David said those words in verse 7? So David stayed his servants with these words, and suffered them not to rise against Saul. But Saul rose up out of the cave and went on his way. Amen. 
Why, why was David's words able to stay them? Why was he able to prevent them from doing harm to Saul? What was going to happen? His words calmed his men. And what was the result of that decision? Inaction. Inaction. These men were wanting action. His followers were wanting action. But Amen. David said, no, there will be no action. Amen. There is inaction. Which resulted in what? Saul waking up, walking his happy butt out of the cave. Saying, I'm fine. He doesn't even know what happened. He didn't look down at his skirt yet. I don't know where he cut it at. But he just walks out. Why? Because there was no action. It was an inaction. Amen. It was, from the men's standpoint, it was inaction in the fleshly standpoint. But it was an action because why? It was a decision not to act, Amen. which is an action in, in itself, pretty Amen. much. In other words, it was moving from the works of the flesh to trusting God. Amen. That is a hard thing for many people to grasp. Because we can't see it. We only see the effects of it after we trust in the Lord. Amen. It's not taking matters into your own hands. Well, you, I understand. we got to do what we can do and God will do the rest. I understand that. But when there's opportunity, it's not taking things into your own hands when there's opportunity to do so. But trusting God for His provision. Trusting God for His timing. Amen. Trusting God for His direction. Um, I'm going to flip over to Psalm 7 real quick, and I'll read this to you. You don't got to read it. And verse uh, 4, I think I wrote it down. David is saying, he says, O oh Lord my God, if I have done this, if there be any iniquity in my hands, if I have rewarded evil unto him that was at peace with me, yea, I have delivered him that without cause is mine enemy. So he says that, it's nice that the Holy Spirit puts that in parentheses, it's kind of interesting to look at, it's kind of important. But David is telling God and asking him, look, if I've done anything wrong, the man that seeks my life, I'm trying to be at peace with him, and yet I have delivered him just now, right? He didn't kill him, I delivered him, that without a cause, there is no cause in me for him to hate me, but he, he, he declares him my enemy. Amen. He say, and he says it himself, mine enemy. Now, when he said that, I don't know if the men heard him talking to God. I think he might have been in his own prayer closet praying to God and crying out to him and saying, God, you got to do something. Amen. God, you got to help me out. God, I, I can't handle the weight of this. Give me grace. Give me more grace and sustain me. And so his servants, David's men, knew David as what? Well, he would go in and out among the people and go in and out to go fight the Philistines. He was a man of war. He was a battle-hardened young man. Amen. He did not play around. He was a man's man. A man who got the job done. Now, after this event, that David didn't do that, what would his men think of him now? He's a warrior. Why is he not cutting Saul's head off? You know, why is he just going ham on this guy? Right? Uh, do they see it? Do they see a different side of David that they've never seen before? Do they see something that is uncharacteristic of his uh, of his character? Is there something uncharacteristic in what he's doing? Why is he doing it this way? I can't understand him. You ever have anybody like that? I just don't get that person. I mean, I've known him for so long, but I just don't get them. I, I, I don't. I don't get David. I don't know how long they've been hanging out with them. You know, they're thinking David having mercy, David not killing killing his enemies. What's the deal? But he was able to stay them with their words. Because I believe you have power with God. Amen. And so he says in verse eight, David also arose afterwards. So Saul already leaves the cave and went out of the cave and uh, ran away. No, he says he cried after Saul. What in the world? You're giving away your position. Why would you give away your position and pop smoke? Saying, my lord the king. And when Saul looked behind him, I don't know how far David was. I'm sure he waited a little ways. Maybe not, maybe not a click, Bruce, but a little closer. David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed himself. That is totally different than what his men have been seeing. 
So why is he now bowing himself to the ground? Well, he just stated what the words and said, that's the Lord's anointed. Mm -hmm. That's God's choice. That's what the people wanted. That's what God gave them. Amen. So David, even though he had the opportunity to kill Saul, he didn't. But he cut the skirt privily, secretly, and it smote his heart. And then he waits for Saul to wake up, go on his way, goes outside of the cave, bows himself and say, it, what? Showing obedience, showing respect for his leader. And David said to Saul, verse 9, Wherefore hearest thou men's word, saying, Behold, David seeketh thy hurt. Why? What was happening? Well, if you are here Wednesday night, you would know. Because uh, men would tell Saul lies so that they could get rewarded by Saul and for those things that he somehow believed. And David asked him, he says, why are you believing what they say? Why are you believing that they're saying, David seeketh thy hurt? He's speaking to the third person. He said, why are you believing those things? Right? Why are you saying that? Now, now continuing on, verse 10. Behold this day thine eyes have seen how that the Lord hath delivered thee today into mine hand in the cave, and some bade me kill thee, but mine eyes spared thee, and I said, I will not put forth mine hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Amen. Now here we get a comparison of the leadership style of David and of Saul. It's pretty interesting. Saul is hearing things and believing them. Saul is hearing things, not really knowing for sure if they're true or not, but he's believing them, even if they're false claims. While David is hearing things from him and his men, and he's there, but he's staying true to what he knows is right. Amen. That's how you know David is a man after God's own heart. And, and, and Saul pulls the sympathy card many a times. He says, basically, to uh, his army, is... is, is why are you all against me, pretty much? You know, why are you guys against me? A, mo a mom can do that. A single dad can do that. Why are you against me, kids? Kids are like, dude, we're just being kids. <laughs> well, you're always against me. Well, like, calm down. Nobody, nobody's against you. Just, that's where the anxiety goes. Because it, it goes to all these things that you want to think about over here. And the anxiety, you have to shake your finger, because that's probably what you're doing in your brain, racking it. But how about we go back to the facts? Like, no one's after you. Saul doesn't know that. He's listening to the lies of anxiety. Interesting. Like that hand Amen. I practiced that. He says, doesn't everyone, Saul says, doesn't anyone have compassion on me? Doesn't that, do you guys realize that, you know, nobody's telling me that uh, my son Jonathan and David have a, have a league have a, have, a, have a pact together, and he's going to be king. Amen. <coughs> Do we see the difference between Paul, or sorry, Saul and David, and just their leadership styles? David points to the Lord in his righteousness. Saul points to himself in his feelings. Amen. He says, why is everybody against me? They don't love me. I'm just trying to serve the Lord. See how, like, when you look inward, it's never good. Amen. Amen. It's never good to do that. So instead of killing Saul, he's asking Saul, look, I, 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 I spared you, I've seen you, I cannot bring myself to do it. There is no way because you're the Lord's anointed. Amen. And he says in verse 11, moreover, my father, see, yea, see the skirt of thy robe in my hand. And I killed thee not. I cut off the skirt of thy robe and killed thee not. Know thou and see that there is neither evil nor transgression in mine hand that I have not sinned against thee, yet thou huntest my soul to take it. Amen. Instead of killing Saul, he waits for Saul to go out of the cave. He bows himself. He yells after Saul when he's a good way off. And, he, and David holds the robe of King Saul in his hand. And which is proof, or should be proof, to Saul's thick skull. That right. Put that in the song. Saul's thick skull with a ball. Right? Uh, it should prove to Saul that David has no intention to hurt him. Amen. It should prove to Saul that, hey, I have no intention to bring you harm. Amen. And that ripped robe should also remind Saul of when Saul ripped the robe off of the prophet Samuel. And when Saul ripped the robe off of the prophet Samuel, what did Samuel prophesy to him? He says, as, as that rent, he said, the kingdom will be rent from you. 
So that should have been an indication for Saul that his time was coming to an end. Amen. That should be a time, an indication for Saul to see and say, my time's coming. Amen. My time's coming. But David chose to do what? He, he, he didn't have to. He didn't have to do what he did here. But he chose to wait on the Lord. Amen. David chose to endure through the trial. He chose to trust God while he was being hunted. He says in verse 12, The Lord judged between me and thee. Remember that in, in our Genesis series? Who said that in our Genesis series? Anybody remember? The Lord judged between me. He said a watch between me and thee. Who was it? Here, have my handmaiden. Oh no, now you sin with her. How dare you do that? The Lord set a watch between me. The Lord judged between me and thee. It was Sarah. Right? And remember what that implies. I'm not going to go into all that. But basically, the Lord watched you. The Lord watched my back and your back. And he says, the Lord judge between me and thee. He didn't say, now I'm going to have my men judge between us. I'm going to set up a nice little court system and see how justified I am. He says, no. He committed all his trust into the hands of him that justified it. Amen. He's the justifier. He's the true one. He's the righteous one. Amen. He is the just judge. Amen. He said, then the Lord avenge me of thee, but mine hand shall not be upon thee. This is proof, this cloth, this robe in my hand is proof enough, Saul, that I will not hurt you. Amen. The Lord will fight my battles. Amen. He says, as he saith in the proverb of the ancients, wickedness proceeded from the wicked, but my hand shall not be upon thee. I don't have the scripture reference for that. Maybe you have that in your Bible. I didn't write it down. After whom is the king of Israel come out? He asked him, he says, why are you out here? After whom dost thou pursue? After a dead dog? After a flea? What is a dead dog? It's unuseful. Amen. What is a flea? It's insignificant. Amen. David is saying, I am an unuseful, insignificant thing. Why are you bugging me? <laughs> Why are you hunting me? I, I, I have nothing against you. You ever, you ever have some people in your life, they're just against you? You ever have an adversary that's just... Ugh. God probably put them in there so that you could not avenge yourself, but commit your hands to him that Amen. judges righteousness. Thank you. Amen. Say, I need to trust God. Amen. It is an act of faith. It is something that I cannot do in and of myself. I mean, I have the ability to just smash their head, but I'm not going to do it because I'd rather choose to wait on the Lord. Amen. And so he says in verse 15, The Lord therefore be judge and judge between me and thee, and see and plead my cause and deliver me, out of thy hand, and uh, we're not going to go through the rest of this chapter, but Saul, you know, he admits his sin, he says, oh, you're more righteous than I, and you will be king, and I know you're going to be king, and all these things, which is pretty interesting. Now, he has another opportunity we're probably going to get into in a couple weeks, and uh, he has a second opportunity in a few chapters later to kill him again, and he refuses to do it. Why? Because he made the decision right here. Right. And I see both of those passages, but we'll just deal with this one today. I see this passage to be a temptation. The men probe David to instigate action upon the leader. And here's the temptation that David had to face. You ready? The temptation was to end the running. The temptation was to end the hunt. The temptation was to get out of the chase, to end the problem, to kill Saul, so that all of this, all of this running, all this despairing, all this anxiety, all of all of this unknown can just go away. Amen. That was the temptation that David was facing. Even it was approved by the brethren. It says, go ahead, whatever's whatever's in your heart. Whatever's whatever whatever it shall seem good unto thee, go ahead and do it. He had the approval of the, all of his people, right? Mm -hmm. Am I reading into this too much? Mm -hmm. Hey, some of y'all give me blanks there. Like, what are you getting at? Just wait. We'll get there. It's a temptation to instigate action. David had the temptation to stop and put an end to the running. He had the temptation to end the chase, to end the problem. And here's where I want to pull you in. Likewise, in the Christian life, we have the temptation to end our trial... By our own means. Amen. We have the temptation to end our trial immediately by our own means. 
Not every time, but a lot of the time. We can struggle through it, we can push through it, we can grit our teeth through the trial, the struggle, the pursuit, whatever happened, whatever the fiery trial is to try you. And we can end it by our own means. Amen. Instead of enduring through the trial by faith. And the temptation is that we can take matters into our own hands. That's the temptation. It's saying, well, all I have to do is push this button here, talk to that person, and get an agreement. So that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty reasonable to do that. And David could have done the same thing. He could have took Saul, he could have grabbed his head like he did Goliath, and cut that bad boy off and say, Hail, I'm the new king. Amen. I don't know if it would go down like that, but that's probably why David didn't do that. So the temptation is we can take matters into our own hands. Whatever the trial may be, whatever the trial of faith is, we can take matters into our own hands, or we can trust God. Amen. We can trust God that He will care for us, He'll help us to endure the trial. Amen. George Mueller said, if we stand firm in the hour of trial, we will see the help of God if we Amen. trust Him. When we forsake the ways of the Lord, the hour of trial, the food for faith is lost. Amen. That's a good statement. Amen. Our faith can only grow when we choose to trust God in all Amen. our trials. Amen. Why? Because if I owe, if I look, if I'm a Christian and I revert back to getting myself out of situations, out of trials, through means of mine own, and the fleshly side, I will always revert back to what I did. I, I, because the next trial that comes, well, how did I get through it on the last one? By my own means. Okay. Got through it. There is no food for faith when you do that. Amen. I hope that makes sense. Hey. For instance, the, the, the pill-popping lady at Fry's, every time she would come to a situation, what does she refer back to? The Xanax. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I, I don't need it. I'm not addicted. Your flesh is very addictive. It is, yeah. it, it is an addictive property thing machine, right? It wants to do repetitiveness. So what I am training in, in my muscle memory, is what I'm going to fall back on. Amen. That's why when when you train for war or combat, you are doing things how you would do them in combat. Amen. No one, if, if Chad's my enemy, I'm not going to be on line like this and go, one, two, three. All right, see. I don't do that. Well, how am I going to train? Do, 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 do. Right? That's how you're going to train. Why not do that in training? In faith, why would I in faith not trust God, or if I don't trust God, I'm going to revert back to my own means. And the muscle memory for the next obstacle of faith is going to be going back to my own means. Amen. And then the next obstacle of faith is going to be going back to my own means. And God will keep giving you the same dumb obstacle to get over until you learn to trust Him. Amen. He says, when are you going to learn? When are you going to learn? And we can stay there that way. If we choose the way of the flesh... There can be no growth in, in faith. Amen. There can be no food for faith. If, and there can be no growth in faith if I continually eat the garbage of the flesh. I have to eat the good fruit of the Word of God. Amen. I have to eat what He wants me to eat. But when we rely on the Lord to sustain us and to strengthen us and to provide for us and seek His provision, He will surely help us if we wait on Him. Amen. If we wait on Him, that's the whole thing with waiting. Nobody likes to wait. And when we do that, God will be glorified. Amen. Not you. Praise God will be glorified. Yes. Oh, I, I came through it, Pastor. No, no, no. God brought you through it. Amen. Give Him the glory. Amen. Let's be a reflection, as James says, and be a mirror. And what bounces off goes back to Him. Amen. Deflecting. Amen. Amen. Amen? Deflecting or ricocheting on purpose. <laughs> And then by the grace of God, we have been fed food for our faith when we trust Him. Amen. In the life of Christ, there was an incident where his brothers, you know, between him and his brothers, that's recorded for us in John, they wanted him to go out and show everybody, tell everybody who he was. He says, because no man that hath this is going to hide himself. You know, he wants all the world to know. He says, my time is not yet come. Amen. Right? When, when Mary comes out and, and says, hey, they, they have no wine. He says, what have I to do with thee? My time has not yet come. 
But he, but Jesus says, your time is always ready. Amen. Is always ready. Jesus waited upon the Father for his timing, for his right moment. Yes. David waited. He didn't do it. He says, I'm committing it to God. Mm -hmm. And what did Jesus Christ do? Committed his life to the Father. Amen. And that time did come where Jesus would give his life, right? Jesus answered them in saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, and abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. And then he goes into the discipleship. The temptation that David had, again, so you don't forget, is the ability or the temptation to take things into his own hands. It is the temptation, almost just like the temptation of our Lord. What? To take things into his own hands. Well, I, don't, I don't get what you mean. When the crowd shouted, and when the um, Pharisees and the Sadducees talked among themselves, and even the thieves said, get down off the cross. Mm -hmm. The temptation was to take it into his own hands. Amen. He could have called 12,000 angels Amen. to destroy the world and set it free. Amen. But he died alone, and he chose to. Amen. 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 Mm -hmm. And we see Christ in the book of yes. in, in, the, in Samuel. He waited on God as he said he would. He gave him the sign of Jonah in the belly of the whale, except the Son of Man will go into the earth for three days. Amen. He gave him the sign. He told him what would be. What would have happened if Jesus um, had not waited on God? What would have happened if Jesus had not waited on God? If he did not trust his Father, if he did not have faith in God. What would happen if he got down off the cross? Number one, there'd be no salvation. Right? Amen. There'd be no redemption for man. He'd be eternally lost. Yes. But because Jesus shed his blood on the cross, because he was physically buried in a tomb and waited three days in the grave, and because he rose three days from the grave, we now can have eternal life through his righteous name. Neither by the blood of bulls and goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered into the holy place, uh, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Once. Amen. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Amen. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven, every things, and, and things in earth, and things in heaven, and things under the earth, that will raise our voices and bow the knee and say, He is Praise Lord. Lord. What is it going to take for you to trust God? What is it going to take for you to trust God? That's the question. What more does God have to show you than what he has already done in your life? Yes. And I get it. We're human and humans forget. But thank God that he's faithful and he never forgets. Amen. And we know that all things work together for good to them who love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Amen. And then he goes further in Romans 8.32. He says, He that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also? freely give us all things. So I'm, I implore you this morning, don't seek a way to get out of your trial. Mm -hmm. Do not seek for a way of your own means to get out of your trouble. Don't even ask God to get you out of the trial. Seek God in the trial. Amen. Don't, don't be tempted to act out your own deliverance through your own means, even though it may be the simplest thing. Why? Because if you go back to the flesh and not rely upon God, you do not grow in your faith. Amen. It is detrimental to your food of faith. Don't, don't be tempted to act out on your own deliverance, whether it is through human strength, ingenuity, finances, or any other means, but rather seek God's face and help for Him to in grace to endure through it. That in the end, we may come forth as gold. Amen. That the trial of your faith be much more precious than of gold that perisheth, Though it be tried with fire, might be found under the praise and honor and glory of the appearing Amen. of Jesus Christ. That's right. Amen. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day. Thank you that we can.